only on the Discovery Channel. For 30 years, the nuclear submarines of the United States and the Soviet Union were locked in a menacing game of hide-and-seek, carrying the threat of instant annihilation right to the shorelines of their enemies. One of these deadly patrols, a disaster hurls a hundred crewmen into a nightmare at sea. The Soviet sub K-219, armed with enough nuclear firepower to destroy the world, explodes in a lethal mixture of fire, water and poisonous gas. Her captain and crew must risk their lives in the effort to avert a nuclear catastrophe just 1,200 miles off the coast of America. September 3rd, 1986, Northern Fleet Base, Gadjevo, USSR, home port for most of Russia's 84 boomers, a Navy term for missile-carrying submarines. It is one of the most tense periods of a Cold War that has lasted for more than a generation. The Soviet submarine force is twice as large as the American fleet, sending a clear message to Washington that a nuclear war might be won beneath the sea. In the 80s, it became apparent that they'd build a rather substantial submarine-based nuclear deterrent capability. If they then came to conclude that they had a secure, capable deterrent, which could, if nothing else, provide a second strike capability against the United States, then that could well tempt them to use their forces. We had to regain a great deal of strength because the Soviets had a marked edge in almost every uh, area of, of potential conflict, in the air, under the sea, and on land. So we had to catch up, catch up very rapidly. That's always much more expensive. It's always much more risky. Uh, and uh, we had to go a long way. In the Soviet fleet, aging craft like the K-219 make up the bulk of an overworked arsenal known to American intelligence as the Yankee class. K-219 has been in Cold War service for 15 years. This Yankee is longer than a football field, capable of maneuvering within a few hundred miles of the U.S. coast and launching 16 unstoppable nuclear missiles toward American military and metropolitan targets. At the bow, 18 torpedoes to sink American warships in underwater combat. The Central Command Post, or CCP, the sub's nerve center. At the heart of the sub, nuclear missiles, each with a different U.S. target and the power to kill millions. Further aft, the atomic reactors that allow the sub to stay submerged for months without refueling. Finally, the rear machinery room with an emergency escape hatch. The Yankee-class SSBN was deployed along the east coast and west coast, and there was quite a bit of alarm about that. The Soviet Navy was spending a lot of its assets protecting the ability of the SSBNs to deliver those strategic missiles to targets in the United States. 0800 hours. Commander Igor Bitanov takes K-219 out into frigid Arctic waters. This mission was similar to the 12 missions I had already accomplished. It was a combat patrol, maintaining constant readiness in the event that we received orders to launch a nuclear strike. We were to cross the Atlantic Ocean, make our way toward the coast of the United States, patrol in waters around Bermuda and finally return to our base. Usually such a patrol takes 75 to 80 days. K-219's missiles carry enough destructive power to obliterate all human life from New York City to Norfolk, Virginia. 
It is a threat that the United States cannot and does not ignore. American hunter-killer sub shadow the Soviet boomers, racing to stay within torpedo range in case of war, to destroy the Russian ship before her missiles can be fired. American submarines had orders to hunt our subs down. They were everywhere, deployed from the Barents Sea near our coast all the way down to the areas we patrolled in the Central Atlantic. They could detect us literally anywhere. My main responsibility as the commander was to do all I could to detect these American submarines and, if possible, escape them. Sending out K-219 is a Soviet countermeasure to a new American threat. In the mid-1980s, Pershing and Tomahawk nuclear missiles menaced the Soviets with instant destruction from launch sites in Western Europe. Russia's response? Double missile sub-patrols in the Western Atlantic. K-219 is assigned twice as many long-duration missions and serviced half as often. Crews are hastily assembled and Captain Britannov finds himself commanding a squadron of strangers. He barely knows many of the 119 men aboard. One of them is a young nuclear reactor expert named Nikolai Belikov. This was not our ship. We were assigned to this sub at the last moment, literally a month before the mission. All our training and preparation had been conducted on another submarine. We were transferred to this ship and had very little pre-mission time to ready ourselves for our combat duty. The technical condition of the submarine was, well, satisfactory. K-219 is designed to carry 16 missiles, but one hatch is welded shut after an accident at sea. A constant reminder that this old boomer is past her prime. A corps of veteran officers must keep her on course, including navigator Yevgeny Aznabayev. Our main objective was to remain undetected. We were constantly on the high combat alert, ready to launch our nuclear missiles. No point making a secret about it now at the United States. It is Aznabayev's job to guide 219 toward America, without America knowing where she is. One of the finest nuclear engineers in the fleet, Gennady Kapitulski is responsible for K-219's fickle, aging reactors. Kapitulski is mentor to a young submariner from a tiny northern village, Sergei Preminian. Sergei Preminian was one of the seamen in our crew. He was a young man, only about 20 years of age. He was that kind of man that keeps the Russia together and keeps the Russian Navy together. One of those simple, responsible and confident young men that makes Russia and its Navy what it is. As the long voyage begins, each compartment reports its readiness to the captain. But weapons officer Alexei Petrachkov hesitates. Missile silo number six shows a slight leak. Petrachkov knows that when seawater contacts rocket fuel, 
The result is deadly nitric acid that could cause a missile fuel tank to blow up. But Petrachkov also knows the entire crew would be punished if a failure in his department were responsible for aborting K-219's mission. He decides to say nothing. At his command post, Britanov issues the order to dive. A last breath of fresh air before their scheduled three months submerged on a stealthy combat patrol. Captain Britanov knows the deep water game of cat and mouse has already begun. The Soviet submarine may have been spotted by an American hunter killer lurking just off the Russian coast. Hey, we've got another one. During the height of the Cold War, at any given time, the United States Navy probably had a minimum of about six submarines somewhere in the world on intelligence collection missions. That number could reach a high of as many as 12 or 15. The U.S. Navy will not disclose if K-219 was under surveillance as it left the Soviet Arctic. The missions of American hunter-killer subs remain classified. September 5, 1986. Britanov knows he is approaching the sophisticated American surveillance network known as SOSIS. Hundreds of thousands of tiny microphones on the ocean floor filter out cargo vessels and whale songs to detect the signature engine noises of Soviet nuclear subs. It is Britanov's challenge to sneak through. We tried to beat the SOSI system by making it more difficult to identify the sound of our submarine. There are ways to do this. For example, we could get through the detection system by running just below the surface in a storm and masking our sounds in the noise of the waves. We could ride in the wake of a noisy ship. For two days, Britanov guides his submarine in the wake of a Russian freighter, a delicate and dangerous maneuver. After a day or two, or even three, we would finally reach the Atlantic Ocean, still hiding behind the freighter. And out in the open sea, it was easy to mask our noise. We had overcome the main danger of being detected. The tactic works. Of the six Soviet submarines deployed in the Atlantic at this time, only one escaped SOSIS. K-219 has broken free. October 3rd, 1986. K-219 is 300 miles east of Bermuda. The submarine creeps close to the surface, bringing in a radio communication from fleet headquarters. The message is received. K-219 must return to her hiding place in the deep. But as the aging sub begins to dive, the change in outside pressure triggers one of the Cold War's most chilling disasters. Water floods into the leaking silo. Alarms sound throughout the ship. Suddenly, Captain Britanov is aware of the grave problem weapons officer Petrachkov chose not to report. I called the missile compartment commander and demanded the report on the situation. He did not answer me. But through the intercom, I could hear the crew working. I could tell that they were already using pumps to drain the leaking silo. I was beginning to realize that something serious was going on back there. I decided immediately to take myself toward the surface, where it would be safe to sort out the problem. It is too late.
Corrosive seawater eats through the thin skin of one nuclear missile. Its fuel tank explodes in a deadly brew of flame, water, and poison fumes. Thousands of gallons of water surge through a gaping wound in the submarine's outer shell. The sub is sinking. Britanov decides that to save his men, he must ignore his strict orders to remain hidden in the ocean. He must get his submarine to the surface, or 119 men are doomed. My mechanic and I simultaneously screamed out the same orders to blow all the ballast and get the sub to the surface. It was an emergency. Who knew how bad the damage was? Maybe there was a hole through the side. The crippled sub strains against the tremendous pressure of the ocean. She violently breaches the surface. In the weapons room, the flooding eases and the fire is out. But poisonous fumes from the missile fuel tank choke the crewmen caught inside. Their lungs gurgling and foaming. Three of them die before the rest are pulled to safety. Petrachkov's decision not to report the leak has cost him his life. The punctured missile compartment is in the center of the submarine. Poison gas pours through compartment after compartment behind the damaged area. KGB officer Valery Shinishny orders 60 men to flee for clean air at the rear of the sub. I heard the emergency alert. I ran out of the compartment asking, what's happened? At that precise moment, the commander announced to the intercom, maximum alert, poison gas is coursing through the sub. Beyond a sealed door, the KGB man and half the crew are safe. For now. Britanov orders navigator Ajnabayev to send an emergency plea for help to fleet headquarters in Russia, 5,000 miles away. Moscow's instructions are cruel but clear. Keep the crew on board despite the danger and wait for assistance from Soviet cargo vessels. Even though the nearest ships are two days sail away, the Americans must not get their hands on K-219 and her deadly nuclear arsenal. Takes notice. In October of 1986, I was the uh, senior intelligence officer for the U.S. Atlantic Command based in Norfolk. This particular morning when I came in, uh, my watch officer showed me some ship tracks that indicated some merchant ships had significantly deviated from their planned routes. Schaefer knows that Soviet subs are in the area. He suspects the merchant ships have been diverted to assist a sub in trouble. At that time, then, I recommended to our operations people that they launch the ready-duty uh, P-3 Orion ASW aircraft that we had in Bermuda and send it to the location that I specified and I felt there's a good possibility when they got there that they would find a Soviet submarine in some distress. Schaefer's hunch is correct. His aircraft records a sight never before filmed in four decades of Cold War. A Soviet nuclear missile sub, stranded and smoking on the surface. She appears helpless, unable to move. And the brown fumes that are seeping from her shredded skin hint at contaminated conditions below. 
the images reach a fascinated audience in Ronald Reagan's Washington. In 1985, I became the director of the White House Situation Room. It is an alert center in the White House that serves multiple functions, most of which deal with processing incoming information that is important to the White House staff, the National Security Council. Having come from the Navy and being grounded in naval intelligence, I was lucky and able to call the director of naval intelligence and ask him personally to send over some pictures because I knew the president would be interested in seeing a Soviet submarine on the surface. And I was right, he was interested. There is another reason for intense American interest. Though the incident remains classified, there is speculation that the leak in the Soviet sub was caused by a collision with a U.S. nuclear submarine. The sub in question is one of the Navy's finest hunter-killers, USS Augusta. Three weeks after the disaster, an American newscast reports that Augusta has suffered severe damage, the result of a collision with a Soviet sub. The submarine Augusta is being repaired under this dry dock shed in Groton, Connecticut. Pentagon sources now reveal that chances are good the Augusta collided with a Soviet sub. The collision caved in a portion of the hull and damaged the nose covering which houses the sub's sensitive sonar and guidance systems. Damage is estimated at one and a half million dollars. Vice Admiral Dan Cooper was commander, submarine force for the Atlantic in 1986. He admits only that Augusta was in the area. The Augusta at no time had a collision with that particular submarine. There was no other submarine of our nation anywhere near there before or during until the Augusta got out near with orders merely to observe. What did the Augusta hit? Soviet naval authorities say it may have been another of their subs sent to assist K-219. Even Captain Igor Britanov of K-219 does not believe he hit the Augusta. Yeah. There is no way I can support this theory. There was nothing to indicate another sub's presence. I want to stress this word, nothing. There were no traces of a collision, no sounds, no creaks, no groans. I know how it feels when you hit something. While K-219 founders helplessly, the U.S. Atlantic Fleet sends a tugboat called the Powhatan to get a closer look and offer to tow the enemy vessel. In Washington, the U.S. Navy reports that K-219 poses no danger to America. President Reagan receives an extraordinary personal message from Mikhail Gorbachev. The Russian leader assures Reagan that there is no chance of a nuclear disaster. But Gorbachev does not know what is happening aboard his own submarine. Poison gas is seeping toward the crew's refuge at the stern. Rubber door seals are being corroded by heat and acid. Each crewman is issued a mask and emergency oxygen canisters. But each canister lasts only 10 minutes, and there are only 30 left. Then, another crisis. At first, there were no signs of fire aboard the sub. But soon, small fires began being detected in certain places. And then somewhere in the fourth compartment, a serious fire began. This fire destroyed the hydraulic system and damaged the reactor control panels. Both of these are located in that compartment number four. Following my orders, the crew now had fires to fight. The situation went from bad to worse. Fire in the fourth, fire in the sixth, sparks flying in the eighth. Temperatures in the crew compartments reach 130 degrees. As the fire spreads, the nuclear reactors begin to overheat. The worst of all submarine nightmares is coming true. The reactors must be shut down. If they burst, the explosion will kill everyone on board 
and an underwater Chernobyl will be unleashed in the Atlantic. But the control rods that can cool the atomic reaction are stuck in the open position by the heat. A nuclear reactor can explode from excessive heat. The result would be massive nuclear contamination, first inside the sub and then of the surrounding waters. Captain Britanov knows he must ask one of his crewmen to risk his life to save the others. He selects Nikolai Belikov. We knew that the position of the rods given certain conditions could result in a nuclear disaster. There was no choice. The commander ordered us to lower the four baffles to their safe, locked positions. No one in America knows the drama that is being played out 1,200 miles from America's shores. Only Belikov and young Sergei Perminin are qualified to deactivate the reactor. Radiation levels are high enough to render the men sterile despite their protective suits. But there is no other way, no other choice. The first time I went into the reactor compartment on my own, the heat was intense. It was more than 50 degrees Celsius. I struggled down to the reactor and managed to lower one baffle. Just then, my oxygen canister ran out. I went back in for a second attempt, this time with Simon Preminen. Between us, we managed to lower the next two baffles. Just as I began working on the fourth baffle, I began to suffocate. We were out of oxygen once again. We had to get out of there fast. Preminen and I stumbled to the eighth compartment, and that's when I lost consciousness. Britanov and Shinishny know there is no alternative. Preminian must go back in. He is the only man who knows his way around the reactor room. Preminian does not need to wait for Britanov's command. The lives of over a hundred crewmates and countless unknowing Americans are in the hands of one Russian farmer's son. One more rod remains to be wrestled into place. With superhuman strength, Preminin shuts down the reactor. The door leading to his comrades and his own survival will not open. The air pressure created by the heat of the reactor room has jammed the hatch. The young hero is trapped. I told him not to talk in order to conserve his remaining energy and his last gasps of oxygen. In order to communicate, I told him to tap on his microphone and let us know that he was still alive and understood our orders. 
But in a few moments, I heard sobbing through the intercom. We all heard it. I realized that Sergei was tearing off his mask. He was probably out of oxygen and he was suffocating. Then the knocking stopped, as well as my communication with him. He died in that compartment, suffocating, sacrificing his life for the lives of the whole crew. These were the last minutes of Sergei Pramenin. What Belikov and Perminian did, I don't know how to describe it, physical and moral heroism. He paid with his life for a great deed. Soviet cargo ships have arrived, but their orders from Moscow are preposterous. The crew must stay on board, accept no help from the Americans, and tow the K-219 back to Russia. The towing speed was limited to just three or four knots. That's very slow. Just try to calculate how long it would take, considering that the distance to the base was almost 7,000 kilometers. Al Hunt witnesses the drama from the bridge of the Powhatan. I identified myself as a Navy ship, a U.S. Naval uh, uh, military Sealift Command ship, and I told them that I had uh, large pumps on board, I had firefighting equipment, I had boats, uh, and I also had towing ability, towing capability that I could offer assistance to them. Well, at that time, they refused. They said, no, just stand by, stay clear. They wanted me to stay seven miles away. It became obvious to me, as a master of a towing vessel, that they were not going to get where they wanted to go. Aboard K-219, Captain Britanov faces another lethal crisis. The heat in the missile compartment continues to rise. Fifteen nuclear weapons could explode all at once, a disaster as deadly as a reactor explosion. Britanov is completely cut off from his men. Four are dead, but 115 are still alive. Captain decides to disobey Moscow and to sacrifice his own career to save his crew. After consulting with the mechanic, we came to the conclusion that the fire in compartment 4 could cause the missiles in that compartment to explode. This meant death to the sub and the entire crew. Considering this was a real possibility, I decided to move the crew to the Russian merchant vessel and stay behind, alone. The emergency hatch leads to clean air and safety. Britanov will be alone for the long tow home, knowing his sub could blow apart at any moment. Why did I stay? Well, first of all, as long as a sub is afloat, it is the commander's responsibility. It's his ship. He cannot leave it. It is my ship. There is another reason I stayed. There were American airplanes overhead. Someone even saw a sub's periscope. There was an American tugboat. And if I abandoned my ship, the Americans might have boarded it and claimed it. This ship was mine. For 10 hours, the Soviet freighter tugs the crippled submarine east. The process is agonizingly slow, but the makeshift tow line is holding.
then in the dead of night, something goes wrong. Somewhere between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., which was the darkest time of the night, suddenly the tow line snapped, and it snapped at its deepest point. I mean, it did not break at the freighter's stern or at the sub's bow. And since there was an American sub there, Augusta, I believe that they cut our tow line. Either they rammed it with their conning tower or with their hull. The U.S. Navy denies that the risky and provocative maneuver took place. If a U.S. submarine had been sent to the area of K-219 to conduct surveillance of the activity, again, because of the rules and the laws of the seas, it would never, never get close enough to the activity related to the uh, casualty or to the merchant ships to in any way interfere whatsoever with the ongoing activity. Alone on a drifting and dying vessel, in one of the most intense moments of the Cold War, Captain Britanov must make a decision. So close to the American shoreline, there is only one safe place for K-219, the bottom of the sea. Observers and submarine experts speculate Britanov flooded K-219. If he did, Britanov himself will never say. When I saw that the seawater had come up to almost five feet from the top of the conning tower, I knew that the sub would sink in a matter of seconds. I took down the ship's flag and jumped into a raft. I looked back and saw the stern and the screws lift up above the water. That was the last time I saw it. It wasn't sinking vertically, it was sinking like this. And then the screws disappeared. Twelve hundred miles from the American shore, the most heavily armed vessel to ever sink plummets four miles down to the ocean floor. One hundred and fifteen survivors of the Soviet sub K-219 arrive at the port of Havana in communist Cuba. For them, it is a dizzying tropical dream. Two days later, Moscow offers a far colder reception. Political officers escort the crew to a rest facility for interrogation. Captain Britanov is received not as a hero, but as a renegade. I got the distinct feeling that both the Navy and the military were looking for a scapegoat, trying to blame someone for the disaster. This is exactly what happened. They blamed everything on us. Everything was our fault. There were no problems whatsoever in the Navy, no technical problems with the sub. Then I was ordered on a vacation. When I came back, I learned that my political officer had been dismissed. Now it was my turn. I was dismissed from the Navy as unfit for service. Britanov faces life in prison. But fate intervenes. Right outside Red Square, a young German aviator lands a small aircraft and makes a laughing stock of Soviet security. Heads roll in the Soviet military, and a new, more progressive leadership pardons Igor Britanov. Today, Britanov and his crew are fighting to reclaim his reputation as an unsung hero of the Cold War. I don't know how a different commander would have acted. I can't possibly comment on this. But I believe that my task of saving the lives of the crewmen, I fulfilled. I wanted to save them, and I did. Sergei Preminin is honored with a posthumous red star for his bravery. 
his father and mother accept his award and the gratitude of the men whose lives he saved. In 1987, the Soviets ceased their Yankee submarine patrols off America. Glasnost is on the horizon. The Cold War is over. The West has won. For America, the long fight for peace is worth the price it paid. The question of the Cold War, I think, is the same one that was on the books before the Cold War. It's that if you want to stay at peace, if you want to keep your freedom, you have to be strong, you have to be willing to fight for peace. But you're only going to get that. You're only going to get that peace if you're very strong. The sailors of the Soviet submarine fleet also believed they were fighting for peace. Now their deadly vessels, which once threatened America with instant annihilation, lie broken and rusting in a Russian harbor. The men who sailed and suffered in them have not been forgotten. On the walls of a church in St. Petersburg, Russia, public tribute has finally been paid to the casualties of a deadly contest beneath the sea. Men who died in silence in a secret war. That undersea war reached its peak when superpower tensions skyrocketed in 1968. It was a year of confrontation on every continent, in every ocean. In two short months, the United States and the Soviet Union suffer their worst submarine tragedies. 200 men are sacrificed to the ocean's depths in one year of turmoil, one year of death beneath the sea. The story begins in Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk is the home port for the American nuclear attack submarine Scorpion. At dawn, Scorpion readies to depart for a covert mission in the Mediterranean Sea. Her skipper is Commander Francis Slattery. He has orders to lead his crew against a Soviet nuclear threat in European waters. Ninety-nine men are aboard. Most are in their twenties, some just barely. Even the officers are all under forty. Many are married with children. They are bound by their elite status, a fraternity called the Silent Service. O900 oh, hours, Scorpion leaves Norfolk. Scorpion is nuclear powered. Her atomic reactor makes her the fastest submarine in the world. And once Scorpion is submerged, she need not surface for three full months. Air and water are created beneath the sea. She will only come home when her crew runs out of food. In the waters off Norfolk, Scorpion submerges and makes her way toward an undersea battle zone. She has come armed and ready for her mission. Scorpion carries 24 torpedoes. Two have nuclear warheads. In the event of war with the Soviets, Scorpion must hunt down and destroy enemy submarines. Con, this is Sonar. We have contact at heading 270. As Scorpion makes her way toward the Mediterranean, a Soviet submarine on the other side of the world prepares to depart on its own deadly mission. February 24th, 1968, Vladivostok, USSR. The nuclear-armed submarine numbered K-129 prepares to leave on a two-month mission. Her task is to aim nuclear missiles at America. Надо прямо сказать, что 
Let me say it straight. We assumed that a nuclear conflict could erupt. Each of the two sides thought that the other could resort to the use of nuclear weapons. Therefore, adequate steps had to be taken in advance, which would enable us to prevent a thermonuclear war, or in case it did start, to deliver a proper, adequate blow to the enemy. K-129 is one of over 400 submarines built by the Soviet Union since the beginning of the Cold War. Small, diesel-powered and deadly, she carries three atomic missiles, each with the power to kill millions of Americans. K-129's captain is Vladimir Kobzar, an ace in communist Russia's highly trained submarine elite. Ninety-seven men are under his command. They are young, alert, and fiercely loyal to the communist cause. Kobzar takes his submarine out of harbor. It will take him two weeks to reach his target, Hawaii. America's tropical jewel, Hawaii, ravaged by the Japanese in World War II, would be a certain casualty in the next world war with the Soviet Union. The Cold War is at its height. The slightest false move could trigger nuclear war. The United States watches as the Soviet submarine force grows in numbers, not yet sure what role these submarines would play in a nuclear conflict. And part of that was driven by our understanding of uh, our limited understanding of what they were trying to do. And it was uh, interesting days. In fact, our understanding of Soviet submarine warfare in the early 70s was driven by U.S. submarine officers who looked at the problem through their own biases, through their own red, white, and blue glasses. The U.S. Navy needs to gain an advantage in the war beneath the sea. For 12 days, K-129 makes her way across the Pacific. Captain Kobzar keeps a lookout for his mortal enemies, American submarines and warships. The crew keeps a constant vigil, rotating through the duties which make K-129 a floating missile platform. Each day is consumed by work and rare moments of leisure that pass time on these long patrols. Diesel subs such as K-129 must surface almost half of every day while underway at sea. The submarine runs on battery power while submerged, and these batteries are recharged by diesel engines on the surface. These are the tense moments when the nuclear-armed sub is most vulnerable to detection. March 8, 1968. K-129 is 1,700 miles northwest of Hawaii, about to surface for the unavoidable routine of recharging her batteries. All seems normal in the control room. It is a maneuver Captain Kobzar and his crew have conducted hundreds of times before. But this time, something goes wrong. A mass 
massive explosion in the middle of the sub blows a 10-foot hole in the hull of K-129. Captain Kobzar has seconds to react. The sub is sinking fast. There's not even time to send an SOS. 98 men face the violence of a submarine being ripped apart. There is no chance of escape as K-129 is gripped in the pressure of the deep. K-129 plummets four miles down, crashing nose first into the seabed. 98 men are dead. It is the greatest loss of life in the history of the Soviet submarine fleet. After we lost radio communication with K-129, I was sent to search for that submarine. I was personally in command of 11 ships. We went to look for her down the route of her deployment. For six weeks, Betts battles a North Pacific storm as he leads the search for K-129. No wreckage is found. He concludes the sub must have sunk, and the Soviets have no way of locating her on the bottom. The search is called off. The Soviets consider their submarine and its priceless, deadly secrets lost forever. Green Scorpion keeps a cautious eye on K-129's counterparts in waters off Europe. Soviet nuclear submarines are in the Mediterranean Sea for the first time since the beginning of the Cold War. Admiral Valentin Ponikarovsky commanded a Soviet submarine division in the Mediterranean in 1968. <laughs> At that time, our task was to match the Americans in mission intensity, and we were accomplishing that task. Those years were quite tense on the high seas. As you might recall, it was quite a hot time in the Mediterranean. Since the beginning of March, Scorpion has stealthily roamed the Mediterranean. The crew is cramped into a windowless steel shark, compartment after compartment of nuclear undersea technology. Long weeks pass without seeing the sun. Strict radio silence is maintained at all times in order to avoid Soviet detection. Life on Scorpion is orderly, cramped, and isolated. Submarine service means sacrifice and pride. Crewman Ronnie Williams writes a letter home explaining his sense of fulfillment aboard Scorpion. Ronnie was very proud of his time in the Navy. And he wrote several letters home and his, letter, his later letters were very philosophical. He was continually talking about how much he wanted to improve himself and how the, he wanted to get a better education and how much he loved the Navy. He was very happy with what he was doing. On one of his last letters, his comment was, I sure like what I'm doing. I love the Navy. And he says, somebody up there must really like me. Chief of the boat, Walter Bishop, is both leader and friend to the men under his command. Wally Bishop was uh, a very, very strong leader. Uh, he is one of the few people that you, you meet in a lifetime that uh, has the ability to uh, lead and also be a friend and also be a, a, a confidant. If you did have problems, you could go and speak to him about these problems. The crew of Scorpion are a fraternity bound by a deep secret. They share the risks of the most dangerous yet unknown missions of the Cold War. Scorpion is a spy sub. Most Americans don't know 
but the U.S. nuclear-powered attack submarine was probably the most effective intelligence collector during the Cold War. Why so effective? Well, first of all, it could carry out any number of different missions. It could simultaneously collect a, a great variety of kinds of intelligence, from acoustic intelligence to intercepting communications to collecting radar data, measuring radiation levels, taking pictures, doing visual intelligence. Scorpion collects data on the Soviet Navy. These photographs are actual images from a Scorpion spy mission. Maneuvering new course, 080 degrees. 080 degrees, aye sir. She also records the sounds of Soviet submarines, each one with its own distinct signature. In the blind undersea war, sound is the only way to stalk the enemy. As Scorpion gathers intelligence on the Soviet threat, Washington makes plans for another, much more risky spy sub operation. The Soviets have lost their submarine K-129, and only America knows where it is. The U.S. Navy has pinpointed the location of K-129 using a top-secret spy network called SOSIS. Hundreds of thousands of listening devices spread all over the ocean floor, track the movements of Russian submarines. One of these microphones has heard the death throes of K-129. Only one month after K-129 is lost, America hatches plans to find her. Soviet submarine hardware, communications and weaponry might be photographed and even recovered, giving the U.S. Navy the advantage it needs. The sub's deadly nuclear missiles offer the greatest prize. So far, U.S. analysts have only been able to glimpse these in distant Soviet military parades. K-129 is in international waters. American intrusion could be seen as an act of war. U.S. President Lyndon Johnson decides it's worth the risk. Beyond him, only a handful of people know about the hunt. One of those people is a young scientist named Dr. John Craven, head of a mysterious Navy bureau called Special Projects. In the 1960s, I was director of the Deep Submergence Systems Project, the Deep Submergence Rescue Vehicle, Large Object Salvage, and classified at the time a number of intelligence projects. The naval submarine intelligence people uh, began to believe that perhaps there was technology that they could use to carry out a program that they had long wanted to carry out, which was to go and search and find hardware on the deepest part of the ocean. Craven's plan is to equip a submarine with a deep sea camera. His choice is Halibut, a nuclear powered sub built in 1959 designed to launch short-range missiles from her deck. The sub is secretly taken to Hawaii for a new mission. Halibut has a large hangar in her bow, once used to store missiles. This hangar now becomes a floating, stealthy, deep-sea lab. And so we modified a first submarine, the submarine Halibut, which is one that I chose from about five or six that were made available. And I chose Halibut because it had a large hangar in which we could put large amounts of, of equipment. Roger Dunham is a young submariner assigned to the strange submarine. To this day, he is forbidden under a security oath to mention the sub by name. I received orders to this vessel, which I'll, I will call the Viper Fish. I'm not really clear to discuss the actual name of the vessel. I walked up to the edge of the dry dock and was absolutely stunned. It was the biggest, the ugliest, the nastiest looking evil thing I have ever seen in my life. The hangar is accessible by a huge door on the top deck. The crew dubs it the Bat Cave. Craven's designers cut bay doors in the sub's bottom, which open and close. Through this hole, a complex photography vehicle known simply as the Fish can descend to four miles down. In May 1968, Halibut's crew begins training for their hunt for K-129 in waters off Hawaii. 
As the United States prepares to gain a Cold War advantage from the Soviet tragedy, cruel fate intervenes. The American nuclear submarine Scorpion is missing. 68, Norfolk, Virginia. An eight-year-old American girl expects a joyful reunion with her father after his three-month submarine mission. Well, that day, being that it was you know, really rainy and um, we expected him to be home when we got home from school. And uh, when he wasn't, sometimes what he would do is he would go and hide and then we would have to try to find him. So my mom said, you know, that he wasn't there and we searched anyways and she said, no, really, he's not there. That the boat hasn't come back yet and that the Navy is supposed to call us. The call never comes. Scorpion will never come home. The Navy publicly declares submarine missing. Ships, submarines, and aircraft fan out along Scorpion's track. Somewhere out on this vast Atlantic Ocean is the nuclear attack submarine Scorpion, or her wreckage lies beneath it. Searchers find no oil slicks, no debris. Scorpion has disappeared in the vast Atlantic. Scientist John Craven is diverted from the hunt for the Soviet sub K-129 to help find Scorpion. But the Navy's secret listening system, SOSAS, has no answers. When the Scorpion uh, went down, the first problem that the Navy had was that it was not detected on any of its standard acoustic arrays or acoustic systems. It could have been anywhere between the Mediterranean and Norfolk, the entire Atlantic Ocean, because there had been no communications during that transit. SOSIS is designed to detect Russian subs. It filters out other noises. If Scorpion sank, SOSIS could not hear it. But Craven has his own secret sources. A small ocean laboratory in the Canary Islands has one microphone in the sea. The Air Force has two others, thousands of miles away from Scorpion's last position. Incredibly, there are faint blips on all three, all leading to one point in the ocean. Four sleepless days after Scorpion failed to return to Norfolk, John Craven gives the Navy their best hope of finding their lost submarine. The sound originated here on May 22nd, 400 miles southwest of the Azor Islands. The hydrophones detected three separate sounds, the first one massive, the next two the terrifying death rumbles of a submarine being crushed in the ocean's pressure. The Navy is skeptical of Craven's acoustic evidence. It assigns just one ship, the deep ocean research vessel Mizar, to Craven's position. Using underwater cameras and sonar, Mizar trawls the area. The waters are over 10,000 feet deep. It could take Mizar months to find Scorpion, if Scorpion is in fact here. June 5th, 1968. A Navy Court of Inquiry convenes. Most of the inquiry is held in secret. Behind closed doors, Scorpion's last days are reconstructed as the Navy seeks clues to her mysterious disappearance. The mystery begins on May 16th in Rota, Spain. Scorpion makes a brief stop at the U.S. missile submarine base here. Her mission is complete. She's heading home. First, she is called upon to help an American missile submarine evade the Soviet subs lurking in the waters off Rota. Two Russian subs have set their sights on the American missile carrier, USS John C. Calhoun. Jack Ebert is sonar operator on the Calhoun. His job is to listen through the depths and locate enemy submarines.
we knew uh, leaving port that uh, there was usually going to be some Soviet boats out there waiting for us to try and track us. Our role was to avoid them at all costs. We did not want them to even know we were in the area. And once they moved on, we would go back to our normal operating conditions. Calhoun must escape her Russian hunters. Scorpion is called in as a decoy. Captain in control. I believe the powers that be called the Scorpion into our op area because she was close and to run interference for us and to break off contact. Scorpion enters the area where Calhoun silently waits. The Russian subs hear Scorpion and take hot pursuit. The missile sub Calhoun is free to go her way undetected. She did her job well. We broke contact with the Soviet boats and we went on our merry way to perform our function, which was again a floating missile platform. After an 85-day patrol, the men of Scorpion have one final mission before returning home. The Navy has a new SOSUS installation close to the Canary Islands. On May 19, 1968, Navy surveillance aircraft detect a Soviet submarine and two surface vessels close to this SOSA station. The Navy is suspicious. Scorpion is called in to investigate. She makes for the area and observes. Commander Francis Slattery cannot determine what the Soviets are doing. After just one day, Scorpion departs and continues toward home. May 21st, 1954 hours. Scorpion rises to within a few feet of the surface. A radio antenna is extended to send a coded message to Norfolk. No mention is made of the Soviets. The message is simple. Scorpion is 250 miles southwest of the Azor Islands and is expected to reach Norfolk at 1 p.m. on May 27th, six days from now. That is the last transmission before Scorpion disappears without a trace. Through the summer of 1968, the Navy's search for Scorpion is daily news. The public knows nothing of the secret search for another downed submarine, the Soviet K-129, in the Pacific. On July 15, 1968, under extreme secrecy, the U.S. spy submarine Halibut departs Pearl Harbor. She is ready for the hunt for the lost Soviet sub, K-129. Halibut is under the command of Captain Charles Moore. Moore bears the responsibility of finding the submarine his president so desperately wants. The mysterious disappearance of Scorpion is fresh in the minds of his crew. Moore is forbidden to tell his men that they are searching for another lost sub, this one, Soviet. The knowledge of Halibut results uh, were down uh, on a single page uh, that you could probably count on the fingers of your hand. Uh, when the mission went out, the only people that were aware of the mission was the uh, captain and the executive officer and perhaps an intelligence officer that might have been aboard. Even the sub's navigator does not know why he's taking the sub to the mid-Pacific or why he's been ordered to fabricate a false course chart for Halibut's crewmen. In one week, Halibut has arrived at the point where the Navy's underwater microphone system, SOSIS, detected K-129 sinking. The hunt for K-129 has begun. The SOSIS data is approximate. The fish must scour the ocean floor 18,000 feet down in a five-mile radius. The mission could take months. If you picture an airliner flying at 20,000 feet, lowering a device on the end of a cable out that great distance all the way down to near the ground, you get some concept of what the technological difficulties were. With the fish fully extended on its tether only 10 feet from the ocean floor, halibut trawls back and forth. Halibut's photographer has not been told what he's looking for. He spends weeks developing meaningless photographs of the alien undersea world. It 
takes four weeks of blind, tedious searching. Then, Moore is summoned to Halibut's Batcave. K-129 is found. America has its prize. When the photographer first photographed it, uh, he became aware that they were photographing a uh, downed submarine, and he was then cleared at some level, but he was not aware of the significance of what uh, he, he, he was photographing. One of K-129's three nuclear missiles is still inside the sub. Halibut provides the United States its first close look at Soviet nuclear missiles. The information is vital to understanding how the distant, secretive Soviet enemy might wage nuclear war. Thirty-two thousand pictures are taken of K-129. To this day, not one of them has been declassified. Soviet Admiral Nikolai Emelko has a sinister explanation for the secrecy. He believes that an American submarine rammed and sank K-129. Среди многих версий, почему она погибла, among the many theories about the cause of her death, I and many others hold that she sank after being rammed by the American submarine, the Swordfish. Swordfish, Американская. Вот поэтому this is why the Americans knew where she had sunk. Submarine collisions remain among the most classified incidents of the Cold War. At least 16 collisions occurred. Not one has ever been publicly acknowledged. But in Yokosuka, Japan, just nine days after K-129 crashed to the bottom, a Japanese photographer snaps this photo of swordfish. The submarine shows no sign of damage. Soviet officials will not give up their conviction that this submarine killed 98 men. The seed of suspicion is planted. After three weeks over the wreck of K-129, Halibut goes home to Pearl Harbor. Captain Moore congratulates the crew on a job well done. The mystified crew can only wonder what the mission was. Captain Moore is greeted at the pier by a U.S. intelligence officer. He hands over a briefcase filled with photographs. These are taken to Washington. Straight to President Lyndon Johnson. He decides the men of Halibut deserve special but strictly secret recognition. Johnson awards them the Presidential Unit Citation, the highest award a submariner can receive. Not one man knows why he has been decorated. At the very time when the men of Halibut are being honored, another submarine search finally comes to an end. The Navy has located its lost scorpion. Navy ship Mizar finds the downed submarine Scorpion, 200 yards from where scientist John Craven said she would be found. The former killer, now a nuclear ghost ship. The wreckage produces more questions than answers. Scorpion is in three pieces, broken in her middle. Her hull must have been penetrated, but how, no one knows. Scorpion's periscopes are fully extended. She must have been close to the surface when disaster struck. And there is another mystery. Scorpion was supposed to be heading for America, yet she is facing Europe. And in our first evaluation, we discovered that if those relative positions were correct, 
the submarine Scorpion was going in the wrong direction and was headed back toward the uh, European coast. We merely asked the question, why would a submarine skipper heading home turn around and go back? Experts scour the wreckage for evidence of a collision with a Soviet submarine. Just as the Soviets accused the American sub Swordfish of sinking K-129, American analysts must determine if the Soviets sank Scorpion. The possibility is terrible, but real. Значит, я о том, что встречались наши подводные лодки и well, I can think of a mass of examples when our subs had close encounters with American submarines. In those years, American submarine commanders had orders to engage in very risky maneuvers against our subs in order to record our propeller noises. They would record our sub's propeller noises, process the recordings, and build a data bank. The aim was to enable them to identify every single submarine of ours in the ocean depths, its type and even its name. One man above all others would know if Scorpion encountered a Russian sub. Valentin Ponikarovsky commanded a division of Soviet subs in the Atlantic in spring 1968. He denies it. Soviet submarines were not and could not be involved in the loss of the Scorpion, directly or indirectly. Our subs were many hundreds of miles away from that area. I can state this with full certainty because I was the commander of one of the two submarine divisions operating in the Mediterranean at that time. Our subs would pass submerged along the African coast to Gibraltar, accomplish their missions, and then, after their patrol time was up, head north toward their home bases. The Azores were of no interest to us. There was no point in conducting intelligence missions there. John Craven seeks another explanation to the Scorpion mystery. He finds it. Scorpion carries 16 MK-37 torpedoes. They are equipped with motors that have a known history of self-starting. The motor can be easily deactivated if the submarine itself is turned 180 degrees, a fail-safe mechanism which prevents a torpedo from homing in on the sub which fired it. Craven's theory is that Scorpion never completed that turn. The malfunction worsens, the torpedo detonates. The explosion floods the bow of the submarine. Then a second catastrophe. The back of the Scorpion telescopes. No one on board would have survived this implosion. At just over 2,000 feet from the surface, Scorpion breaks apart. The inquiry has its answer. It reluctantly accepts John Craven's torpedo theory as the most likely cause of the Scorpion tragedy. The case is closed and other events in 1968 dominate world attention. The assassination of Martin Luther King in March, Robert Kennedy in June, and the daily televised carnage of Vietnam overshadow Scorpion. The tragedy of K-129 is completely covered up. The Soviets never publicly admit their loss, and Halibut's mission is supposed to remain secret forever. It is as if neither sub ever existed, but the story is far from over. I, Richard Bilhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear 
that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. So help me God. January 1969. Richard Nixon replaces Lyndon Johnson as President of the United States. Nixon is shown the spy sub Halibut's photos. He wants more than mere pictures. He wants the sub K-129 itself. And he wants the CIA to get it. The covert operation is codenamed Project Jennifer. The front is an eccentric billionaire, famous aviator and CIA operative, Howard Hughes. The cover story is classic, sensational Hughes. Deep ocean mining for precious metals. Between 1968 and 1974, Hughes builds Glomar Explorer. It is hailed as the most advanced mining vessel in the world. What the public does not know is that the ship's half billion dollar price tag is being paid not by Hughes, but by the CIA. The inside of Glomar Explorer has nothing to do with mining. The moon pool, a cavernous empty space into which K-129 is to be raised. On July 11, 1974, Project Jennifer begins. The huge ship hovers over the site of K-129, descending in an agonizingly slow one inch per second. A gigantic mechanism nicknamed Clementine takes two days to reach the submarine. The operation is maintained in a control room adjacent to the moon pool. Clementine captures K-129. The two-day ascent begins. Five thousand feet from the bottom, the mission takes a terrible turn. Clementine's arms snap. Two-thirds of the submarine fall back to the ocean floor. The crippled Clementine continues to bring a fragment of K-129 toward the surface. The remaining forward third is brought on board for examination. It tests highly radioactive. CIA men in protective suits dismantle the submarine. K-129's nuclear weaponry is taken apart piece by piece. The shattered remains also produce another prize. Communications gear, the sub's secret link to Moscow, is now in American hands. The remains of six Soviet seamen are also recovered. They are buried at sea in Soviet tradition. The ritual is filmed with hopes that should the Cold War come to an end, there is proof of American respect for the unfortunate dead. Clementine is disabled, but the CIA still wants more. Plans are made to return the following year for a final mission to retrieve K-129. But on March 15, 1975, the CIA's ambitions are destroyed. Documents are leaked to the press, having been stolen in a mysterious robbery at the Hughes headquarters. By the time the story is revealed, Hughes is on his deathbed. The robbery remains unsolved. Soviet leaders are furious. Their long-lost submarine and 98 missing men exposed by the American media, they can do nothing. The Americans had no legal right to raise a foreign submarine in neutral waters. Especially since it was already clear that it was our submarine. 
The United States does not want to incite the Soviets. No further operations are conducted over the gravesite of K-129. But America's own submarine, Scorpion, is a different matter. Submariners are not satisfied with John Craven's theory of a torpedo accident. In 1985, the Navy summons Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution to re-examine Scorpion. Robotic cameras try to enter the torpedo room and fail. But one fact is clear. The torpedo room hatches are blown outward, as if from an internal explosion. With no other evidence, John Craven's theory of a torpedo accident prevails. The Navy has still not affirmed, and I will not affirm, that it is the torpedo that caused the loss. Okay? And the reason for that is, is that uh, regardless of how good the evidence is, it's only a probability. I personally believe that the highest probability is that it was a torpedo, and that other scenarios are of lower probability. The Navy believes that there are several theories have equal probability. And again, depending upon whose ox is gored, uh, you will find naval officers that choose one or the other. Whatever caused the Scorpion tragedy, the United States Navy never loses another nuclear submarine. The Cold War would have other submarine casualties, but not two in one year, only two months apart. The men of Scorpion and K-129 did not die in vain. Their missions were part of the balance. For families of Scorpion, a simple memorial proclaims their loss. They gather on Pier 22 at the Norfolk sub-base, the same hour, the same place, where they waited in vain 30 years ago. I'm both honored and humbled to be here today to remember and pay tribute to the brave crew of USS Scorpion who were lost at sea 30 years ago this month. Few events are so locked in time as the loss of Scorpion in May of 1968. Pause with me now as we remember our shipmates still on patrol on USS Scorpion. Commander Francis Atwood Slatery, commanding. Executive Officer Lieutenant Commander David Bennett Lloyd, Chief of the Boat. Chief Torpedoman's mate, Walter William Bishop. Tribute is paid to the men who never came home. Petty Officer Stephen Charles Nixon. Petty Officer Joseph Francis Miller, Jr. Petty Officer Cecil Frederick Moore. Petty At a small pierside ceremony, their legacy is finally honored. Get up-to-the-date facts and information on the web daily by logging on to Discovery.com. Right here, right now. Discovery.com. This Wednesday, uncover ancient stone temples and remote island palaces on Discover Magazine. Next, it was the world's first war to be won by mechanical skill. Learn how these unarmed machines dominated the battlefield on machines that won the war. And today, they carry enough power to destroy the planet. Submarine disaster on On the Inside, coming up.